named Ginger is his wife. Uh, he continues to be in the hospital. Uh, he does have some procedures even in the future with his with the uh, um, brain surgery and other brain surgery that he will go through in the future. So um, it's really a tough situation for both of them. They're a young couple with kids. So just continue to pray for them. Um, also, uh, I was just told that uh, as far as James and Joyce Parker are concerned, the friends of the Freemans, uh, Joyce is out of the hospital right now, but I think we'll be going back uh, real soon, so just continue to keep you in their prayers. Also, add uh, James, Leggett to your, uh, James Leggett and his family to your sick list because of his mom. She's in the hospital having tests run, possible heart problems, so uh, let's keep them in our prayers. Also, uh, Ernestine Reese, sister of Carrie Ray, had a heart attack and is on life support. So let's play, pray for Carrie's, Carrie and her family, and particularly for Ernestine, uh, his, uh, her sister. I will have other announcements about the activities and things after services. So as we begin our worship this morning, let's go to our Father. Holy Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this time that you've allowed us as your church, your family, Father, to come together this morning. Father, we're grateful for our visitors being here with us. Father, and as we worship together, our prayer is, Father, that our minds will be focused on you and your Son. As we sing praises to you, Father, help us to edify one another, build each other up through the words and truths that we sing, Father. As we listen to your word proclaimed, Father, we pray that we will have our attention focused on your words and make application in our life, Father. And Father, we do uh, pray for uh, our time as we commune together, Father, that our minds will be focused on the death of your Son. Father, again, we're grateful for this time. We yearn and hope, Father, that, that our worship is truly on your behalf and to glorify you, Father. Help our minds to stay focused on you this morning is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
morning will be in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling you. As soon as she heard this, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are, we are so thankful that we can come here this first day of the week and, and come and worship you. We're so thankful that we have this avenue of prayer with which we can reach out to you and request comfort and, and prayers for the things that are going on in our lives. We know that so many people are, are struggling right now with with the uh, ongoing COVID issues and uh, just the uh, difficulties of life in general. And I pray that we can get some comfort in that from you and be able to put that aside for now so that we can focus on, on worshiping you this morning. <clears throat> Lord, we're so thankful for all the blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, most notably for your son who you sent down this, on the cross so that we could have home with, heaven with you one day. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over Gary as he brings us our lesson today. Help him to remember his remember his lesson and help us to be attentive, help us to focus on what he says so that we can, can use those things that we learn here and uh, be the best Christians we can as we go about our daily lives. Lord, we ask you to continue to be with this congregation, be with our elders and our deacons. Help those that are making decisions here to, to make the right ones to continue to, to grow this, this congregation, to, to reach out into our communities and to help as many people as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. morning, if you're using a book and need to mark the invitation song, it'll be 707. 707 will serve as the invitation song. <clears throat> Before our lesson, we'll sing 194. 194, if you will, please stand. 
Good morning. It is such a joy to be here, to be with all of you today. Uh, of course, all those that are here in person, but also uh, those who may not be able to be with us in person, we're, we're thankful you're able to join us online. That's, that's a blessing. Some people have come, I think, to realize how much a blessing that is. Uh, since all this has transpired, they're still struggling with uh, illness and things like that, and yet they're able to be with us uh, both visually and in spirit, and we're thankful for that. We're certainly thankful you're here uh, today with us. If I were to say Jesus and ask you to give one word to describe Him, what word would you use? Somebody said perfect, loving, Savior, see all kinds of, and they're all wonderful, wonderful things. I wonder if anybody would have said angry. It's not the way we usually view Him. We don't think about Jesus being angry. It is so rare, so unusual in the life of Christ to, to hear Him be described as being angry. That It seems to me it's important to stop and fig, figure out what's going on here. What lesson is there to learn from an angry Jesus? Because the lessons are powerful. First of all, an angry Jesus is a Jesus who cares for the hurting. Turn to the book of Mark with me, if you will, to Mark uh, chapter 3. Uh, and as we get to, to Mark chapter 3, we we come to another one of those incidents where Jesus is clashing with the Jewish leaders. Now, he doesn't do it on purpose. Uh, instead, he does what he came to do, and they clash with him because they don't like it. They don't like his approach. They think he doesn't care about their thinking on Scripture and so forth. And so this is another one of those cases. Look at uh, Mark chapter 3, beginning verse 1. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Now, pause a minute and watch the nature of these, of these Jewish leaders. Are they watching to learn? That's a pretty easy answer, isn't it? No. They don't have any interest in learning. Are they, are they watching because they recognize He's the Son of God, and they want to honor Him? And again, the answer is obvious. No. They're not watching for that. Mark very specifically says they're trying to accuse Him. So... Here's what transpired. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Anger. What made Jesus angry on this occasion? And the answer is clear, because Mark tells us. It was their hardness of heart. That word hardness is a tough word, for at least for me. I don't identify with that entirely. What about if we said it this way? Their calloused heart. Now all of a sudden I begin to understand just a little bit what's being talked about here. In my lifetime, even as a young boy, I can remember uh, meeting men and being around men who, who labored at very difficult jobs. And oftentimes you'll find that their hands are 
have uh, calluses you know, all over them because of, of the continual stress that is put, is put on them. Their, their hands grow hard. In Africa, when I used to go to Malawi and teach the, the preacher students there and the preachers, uh, I, I found out something that just about stunned me. They have some, some pretty uh, mean, uh, venomous snakes. Uh, one is a, a cobra, and the other one's a black mamba. And what I was told was this. If the cobra or the black mamba bit uh, one of those fellas on the bottom of the foot, it didn't penetrate. They're, they went in bare feet all the time, and their feet had become, well, almost like the soles of my shoes, you might say. They were cow- Now think about a people that have grown so calloused against those in need that they can't even think about them. Is that... Does that Remind you of the Lord in any way at all? I think about the times where Jesus uh, sees the multitude and the, the disciples uh, are saying to him, look, these folk need to, they need to go, go somewhere. They need to get something to eat. They've been with you a long time. He won't let that happen, will he? Instead, he, he wants to know, well, what do you have? What can we feed them with? And he uses that, of course, to work a couple of miracles, feeding one time 5,000 men and another time 4,000 men, and neither time does that count women and children. Jesus sees people in need, and he immediately responds to that need. He heals the blind men. He heals the leper. He touches the leper and heals him. That within itself is remarkable to see him do that. He comes upon a widow in Nain, who is literally going out, we'd say, with the casket of her only son, and he stops that funeral. And I love to say this about him. He broke up funerals. <laughs> because any time he comes upon a dead person, he raises them. Jarius' daughter, he raises her. The people, the people are saying, crying and weeping. He says, what are you doing? He, she's just asleep. And they laugh at him. But what does he do? He raises her from the dead. Jesus cares about the hurting. Now, brethren, I want us to think about this. Can we really be acceptable in the eyes of Jesus if we don't care about the hurting? If we don't feel with them? I'm not going to elaborate in great depth on this, but Yesterday, at long last, I got hold of the phone number of my cousin, who was like a brother to me growing up. He has dementia now. And when I called him, he didn't even know who I was at first. didn't recognize my voice. He didn't recognize stories from our past. But when he realized who I was, he just kept saying, Oh, this is so cool. Over and over again, this is so cool. Can you really see somebody in need and not care? Not if you're like Jesus. Luke reports this same incident. I want us to listen to what he has to say as he reports what they said. And then I want to draw an interesting conclusion that I believe logically follows. They asked this question. Is it, he asked them this question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? Now first of all, observe, they won't answer. They're not interested really in, in true religious questions and how we ought to serve God. They have no interest in that. When J.W. McGarvey looked at that question, though, he said, the question implies that a failure to do good when one is able is harmful and sinful. Now, I want you to parallel this. Go to 1 John and see if that isn't exactly what Jesus said. 
If you see your brother have need and shut up your bowels of compassion from him, mm, you're in a lot of trouble. An angry Jesus teaches us to care for the hurting. But Jesus also wants children to come to him. Go to the book of Mark now, if you will. Mark chapter 10. In Mark 10, we find this story related by Mark, beginning in verse 13 of Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I should have looked this up in other translations. The word displeased is not really uh, demonstrative of what this word means. In reality, this word means to be vexed or indignant. He is angry. With who? With his disciples. Why? Because they think children are a bother. He's got more important things to do than deal with children. Take those children, get out of here. What do you mean bring these children around here? This has never happened here, but I've been in congregations where people complained about the noise coming from children. Let me tell you, you don't have that noise you're dead. That's where you're going. You're dead. A bunch of gray heads with no children. I'm one of them. I can, I can say that now, right? A bunch of gray heads. We're dying if we don't have children. I thank God for every child we've got in this auditorium today. And the truth is, I want more of them. Folks say, doesn't, doesn't that, didn't my crying child bother you? And you know, my answer is there are only two children ever bothered me when they cried. It was mine. I'm not going to pay attention to the rest of them. You know, they're okay. You'll take care of them. It works out fine. Jesus was angry because they wouldn't let the children come to him. Now listen, as he goes on in this story, <clears throat> Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. <clears throat> And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think Jesus would do if he were with us today at Sival Road? <clears throat> you think he'd say to moms and dads, you ought to be here all the time? I think he would. You think that he would say, you ought to get your children to Bible class and get them there early. Brother, we ought, to, we ought to be embarrassed. We arrive at a football game in time to have a tailgate party, and we can't get to Bible class until it's 10 minutes old. What's wrong with that picture? And do I look angry? I'm a little bit angry. I'm frustrated by that. It's not right. You want your children. I want my children. I want your children. I want all the children I know to come to Jesus. He's going to show them love, what real love is. He's going to change their lives. <clears throat> but we got to bring them. It's not a good idea for moms and dads to drop off their children. I'll come with them. Join them. I haven't asked Logan about this, but I, my suspicion is that, if, that every family that wants to come with their children is welcome to be a part of every gathering. Why? Because the family that stays together in worship and praise of God and in learning the will of God is the family most likely to get a great reunion in heaven. Don't you think? I think so. An angry Jesus 
teaches us that He wants children to come to Him. An angry Jesus also demands respectful worship. This is probably the story that most people thought I was going to go to to begin with. It's in uh, John chapter 2. Uh, it's early, according, at least in the, in the story as John relates it, of the life of Christ. There is another incident that seems to parallel this later in the life of Christ. Very, very similar. Let's pick up at verse 13 of John chapter 2. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. Now, let me pause a minute. Let's give a little background here. What's going on? These people, Jews, came from all over the world. If you can't tell that by this story, go, go to Acts chapter 2 and look at the list of the nations that came on the day of Pentecost. There are a bunch of them. Well, they knew that they had sacrifices to offer, but, you know, in that day, bringing your cow from... Uh, from Greece to Jerusalem, was well, it just wasn't really feasible, was it? And so what they would do is they would sell their cow at home or their sheep or whatever it was. They would sell them at home. They'd take the money in their hand and they would bring it with them to Jerusalem. And when they got there, they would buy a replacement, so to speak. Uh, an, another sheep or another, another ox or whatever it is they were going to offer, they would buy it there. And so, you know, this, the buying and selling of the animals is to be expected to some extent. And then also they had to, they had to pay what sometimes is called the temple tax. And that was usually paid with, with the money that was suitable to that area. And so again... You, you know, when I go to uh, some foreign country, I have to exchange money, you know, sometimes to be able to function in that land. So they needed money changers to take their, their Greek money and turn it into money that would be used in the area around Jerusalem, something like that. That's all understandable. So what's the problem? Well, look where they are. They're in the temple doing this business. Now, where are they probably in the temple? I can tell you where they are not. <laughs> They're not inside what's the, uh, the naos. They're not inside the, the primary portion of the temple where God is worshipped. So it is most likely that they are in the, what's called the court of the Gentiles. Now, imagine that you're a Gentile and you're coming to Jerusalem and you're trying to worship God. And when you come in, the whole court where you normally worship is filled up with kiosks. That's what we call them, right? A whole bunch of, of booths where people are selling things and they're exchanging money. There are cows all over the place. There, there are sheep all over the place. It is pure bedlam. And that's where you're supposed to worship. Now, pick up again. We're still in John 2. Let's pick up verse 15. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, uh, the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now the word translated zeal is a word that means passionate enthusiasm. And you may not see that as anger, but when I read the story, I see anger. I think he is really upset. Why? because they are ruining any possibility of respectful worship. Now, brethren, don't you think that ought to be a, a type of a warning bell to us in regard to our worship? 
Worship is not something that we come to do just to check something off. Do we go through the motions in worship? Or do we put our heart behind it and in it? In John chapter 4, just, just a couple of chapters over, when he talks to the woman at the well, doesn't he say God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth? I have observed about my brethren that we're, for the most part, very interested in getting it truthfully right. And that's a good thing. I'm glad for that. But it's not enough to get it truthfully right and leave the heart out. If there's no heart in it, then the worship is not pleasing to God. And you've got to wonder, I, I wonder, would Jesus, so to speak, overturn the tables of my heart? <laughs> would he say, you know, you need to get this stuff out of here and quit thinking about it, and you need to focus on what you need to focus on? My suspicion is, on occasion, he might do that. An angry Jesus teaches us respectful worship and the value of it. But he also teaches us that he's angry with sin and illness and death. You heard uh, Chris read this passage a few moments ago. In my lifetime, I could not even guess how many times I've read John chapter 11. I, I would dare say it's, it's way, way, maybe even a hundred times I've read this chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. It's a powerful chapter. In all the times I've read it, I never saw what was called to my attention by an article that another fellow wrote that really set me on this path that I've gone down today. <clears throat> Let's go back. You heard what Chris read. Jesus has come now. You remember, Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha sent word, didn't they? Lazarus is sick. And you've got to wonder what they expected. Did they expect Jesus to hurry and get there in time to, to heal him? My suspicion is they did. Now, I said it's a suspicion. You choose another view, I'm okay with that. As long as it doesn't go against something else in this text, that's fine. But he finally arrives when the body's been in the ground four days. <clears throat> and the first one he sees is Martha. And they have an interesting discussion, don't they? Because he says, you know, basically, I'm going to raise Lazarus up and and she says, well, Lord, I know that in the last day, she's talking about the end of time, you're going to raise him up. She knew that much. But she didn't understand what he really was talking about. Well, as soon as Martha left Jesus, she ran and, and told Mary that the teacher's here. And, and Mary knows who she's talking about. She's talking about Jesus. That's who they sent word to. And that's what they called him, the teacher. And so she gets up and she goes to meet him as well. And it's in that context, in the book of John, chapter 11, that we begin to pick up some interesting ideas. Look, look at verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That makes me suspect that's why they asked him to come. All right, now go to the next verse. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Two words in this text I want us to look at. The first, he groaned in the spirit. If you look that word up and check for a definition... The definition is anger, indignation. Now, how angry was him? Well, you see that word troubled? The word troubled could be translated, he shook. He started angry, he's shaking. Now, I got a question for you. 
Is he angry with Mary and Martha? I don't think so. Is he angry with Lazarus, the dead man? Well, I don't think that either. What's he angry about? There's no reason for anybody to have to get sick or die. The devil who was a murderer from the beginning, and that is exactly how Jesus describes him in the book of John, John chapter 8, he picks up on that idea. He's a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar and he's a murderer. When the devil tempted Eve and she and Adam partook of the forbidden fruit, sin and death entered the world. Jesus is not angry with God, like a lot of people are when they see illness and death. He's angry with the devil to the point of shaking. Now, you go on down in the text, and this puts a whole different light on several things that I see in what follows. And he said, where... Have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Two little verses. Shortest verse in the English language. Why did he weep? It didn't have to be this way. If sin had never entered the world, it did not have to be this way. And then we go on. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? And some of them said, could not this man have opened the eyes of the blind, also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. And guess what? That word groaning is from the same word that we got the word groaned from in verse 33. He was angry he was filled with indignation. How far did it go? How angry was he? You ever get angry and then don't do anything about it? I, I'd say we do. You know, that thing that I, you know, set out there to work on that I keep. You know, running into and scarring my, my, my knee on. Yeah, I get angry about that. How angry am I? Well, apparently not very angry because I'll hit my knee on it again. It ain't going nowhere. It's going to stay right there. <laughs> How angry was Jesus? Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Inasmuch then, this is verse 14, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Jesus was so angry that he gave up heaven. He was so angry he came down to earth and he took a body just like I have and just like you have. He gave up all the praise, all the honor, all the glory that was his around the throne and he came to earth. What was his goal? The New King James says to destroy the devil. That's not quite the best translation. The idea is to render him inoperative. And if you're talking about a dog that keeps biting you and you want to keep the dog, it means yanking his teeth. So that all he can do is gum you when he tries to bite on you. Jesus saw the vicious nature of the devil 
and how he desired to cause every soul to be lost in eternity. And he used death as a weapon to hold us in bondage and in fear. And Jesus said, I'm going to earth. I'm giving up heaven. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die so that death will forevermore be beaten. I don't know about you, but I am sure thankful he was angry. Jesus teaches us some powerful lessons, doesn't he? Usually, he teaches us in a loving way. But four times, as I see it in Scripture at least, his anger teaches us the things that were most important to him. It was important to Jesus to take care of the needy. It was important to Jesus to make sure that the, the children were taken care of and had an opportunity to come to Him. It was important to Jesus that worship would be respectful and would honor His Father as it ought to. It was important to Jesus to take the teeth out of the devil, to overcome sin illness, and death. If you read Revelation chapters 21 and 22, one of the most beautiful statements that is made in all of Scripture is made about heaven. Will there be no more pain? No more sorrow? No more death? How did he do that? He gave his life to set me free. Please do not sit here and know that you're not right with the Lord and let anything stand in your way. If you're a Christian who has strayed, ask for prayer. If you're outside of Christ, please come to Him. He gave His life so that you can be set free. All you've got to do is yield to Him in penitent baptism. And He'll set you free. And the devil's teeth will be taken out. If you're ready, He's already ready to give you. Why don't you come up while we sing? Why keep Jesus waiting, waiting in the cold? He
when we sang, while we sang the invitation song, Trinity, uh, Freeman came forward and she has this note. Uh, she says, having your uh, parents look at you with disappointment is one of the most heartbreaking things one can experience. Uh, she talked about how the Christian life certainly is hard, and so she needs to uh, the prayers of us to help her in her uh, this challenging time. So we won't honor that. So let's go to our Father prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that it pricks us, Father, and helps us to know of our sin, Father. We're grateful for that because we know it is sin that keeps us from heaven, Father. We're thankful for our hearts like Trinity that recognizes that there are times that we disappoint each other. There are times we disappoint you. And so, Father, we're grateful for our heart. And we're grateful for forgiveness. So we ask that you would forgive her, Father. And Father, help us to be an encouragement to her and to her family as they continue to strive as a family to, to be more like you would all have us to be. Father, again, we're grateful for this time of encouragement, time that we can come together and pray and help each other. Uh, continue to be with us as we continue our worship to you as our Father in Jesus, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The song before we commune together will be 634. 634. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, in thanks. Lord, I pray that as we partake of the bread, that we can remember of the sacrifice that was given on the cross, of the flesh that was shed on the cross for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that we can take that in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in thanks. Lord, I pray that as we can open our hearts and remember the, what you've done on the cross for us, remember the blood that was shed, the sacrifice that was given. Lord, I pray that we can remember, we can take this cup that represents the blood and do it in the well please in your sight. And just name I humbly pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. In a few moments, Scott will come back up and have prayer, closing prayer, and also prayer for the giving. Uh, just a few announcements about uh, the events that are coming up. Uh, you have them all listed for you there in the bulletin. I want to uh, say a few things or try to bring closer attention. Remember on October 31st, there will be a fellowship meal after morning services. Um, so we'll have morning services, and then we'll have a meal together, and then we will have an immediate, immediately following our meal, we'll have the afternoon service. On that same evening, we will have trunk or treat at 6.30. Uh, Women of the Word, uh, I believe that's next Monday, November the 1st, Early Risers Men, uh, November the 2nd. Uh, so that will be next Tuesday. Deacons, remember your budgets need to be uh, uh, given to either an elder or to uh, William Case or Mark Pope. Please, uh, please make sure that you get those in by today if you, if you at all can. The others need to start working on that. Uh, uh, don't forget to continue to pray for Trinity and her family. Uh, also, I was given a note from Loretta Wallace. Uh, she just made a comment that, remember a few weeks ago, she was moving, going to be moving to, uh, I believe it was Texas, uh, but uh, things have changed. So she's gonna remain here with us uh, sometime longer. So let's continue to pray for her. And we're grateful for her uh, staying around a little bit longer to be with us. So if you would uh, stand for our closing prayer, closing song. Uh, 
closing song will be number 46. Number 46. Bless be the we can open up our hearts and give back so a portion of what we've been given all right let's go to God in prayer Heavenly Father thank you for allowing us to have a job somewhere that we can live freely Lord Lord I pray that that we can give back a portion which you so richly blessed us with Lord that we can open up our hearts so that we can further your kingdom, further the work that's being done here at Sidewell, that we can further the work that's being done across the world, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, Lord, that we can be an example for what you want us to be. Lord, I pray that we can spread your word to those who need it, Lord, and to those. Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, that we can be in a shining light to those in need. Lord, I pray to be with the sick, be with the doctors, nurses, taking care of them. Lord, I pray that you be with the ones who've been affected by COVID. Lord, be with them and their families. Lord, I pray that you be with the elders and their wife. Lord, I pray that you be with the ministers we have here. Lord, I pray that you be with the deacons and their wives. Lord, keep us safe to the next point of time. And just in my prayer, amen.